Okay, good morning. It is Thursday, August 12th. Cannot believe it's the middle of August. Uh, sure feels like it because it's incredibly hot out there, and we may talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but as always, let's um, start off with uh, a Pledge of Allegiance and uh, take a moment after that. Please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Before we take that moment, if you will, I would like to concentrate this morning on the tragedy that happened next door. Uh, we lost um, a captain in the Frederick County Fire Rescue Service last evening, and I would ask in your moment of silence that you keep uh, Captain Laird and his family in your thoughts and prayers. Thank you, Commissioner Wings. Okay, let's uh, let's move on to uh, prior to Carol. We do have a open session this morning, and then we will follow up with a 1 p.m. coming back for open session, I believe, oh. this afternoon. So oh, you're killing so me. You're not going to. You're, you're killing gonna, me, Smalls. You're, you're not going to beat the bridge <laughs> this time. So uh, <coughs> let's start with uh, priority, Carol as we always do, and Commissioner Frazier, why don't you lead us off? Okay. How come you get to start? What'd you do? <clears throat> um, this past week I was at the, um, or actually this week, at the uh, City Council meeting for the City of Westminster. Actually it was a very timely one to go to because they had an update on their uh, high-speed fiber project, the Ting project, and they had the update on uh, uh, MAGIC, which kind of ha goes hand in hand. The, the fiber optic, uh, high-speed fiber project is going along very well and I didn't write down the exact but the uh, uptake on that uh, is houses that they for residential it's about 40 I think they said about 40 45 percent is uptake of people that, that uh, you know the fiber is going by right now they haven't hit all the areas yet but they're pretty close you've also <laughs> have hit two people I think it was two people outside the city of Westminster that are like right on the border that asked for it and they dropped dropped them a line uh, that way which is good um, so both things moving along very well for, for uh, you know, for Westminster and Carroll County because it, it helps Carroll County when more people see the, the high-speed fiber that they have in the area and they can bring more businesses in and, and help, help out that way. have to say, mention something about vaccines again. If you don't have one, please get one. We can put this thing under our foot if everyone would get their vaccines. And, you know, the vaccines are not 100% they're not 100% uh, foolproof. They're like 93%, which means it, people that get the vaccine can still get COVID. Yes, they can. But like 93% chance that you won't. So it, it's worthwhile. I've heard many people say, you know, I've heard different information about this. And some, one person says that and one person says this. No one, no one credible has ever said, don't get a vaccine. No one. And I'll stop right there. Thanks. Okay, Commissioner Weaver. Uh, first of all, I uh, attended the town of Hampstead's uh, public hearing the other night on uh, North Carroll High School. They're zoning. They uh, had their public hearing. They're going to act on zoning in September. I know things got delayed a little bit due to stormwater management, uh, but should be in place hopefully by uh, for settlement on that project by September, in the September. Also. Uh, spent last night at the Board of Ed meeting and uh, they had quite lively discussions uh, with uh, <laughs> masks and quite a few things here but uh, you know they're still optional here until uh, the governor or whatever comes up with their uh, uh, says what they want to see in uh, that area but um, you know it's up to parents to keep their children safe and right at the present time it's the way they're looking at it so uh, uh, you know this is going to be an interesting uh, opening of the school so I think this fall and you know uh, as far as quarantining students and those type things so that it's an issue they're, they're dealing with and, and uh, uh, 
They also, uh, we do have a joint meeting the 23rd of September with the Board of Ed, so that ought to be uh, some of my topics. We can get some information, uh, joint information. And the fact we have those quarterly meetings is very important. I think communication between the two boards, because they are about half of our budget, uh, it's very important that we keep those communication lines open, what's going on and uh, what they're doing with those, uh, with that funding. So. Uh, even though the meetings are a little long, I think it was almost 11 o'clock last night, 10, quarter of 11 or something like that was over. But anyway, um, they uh, do get a lot accomplished in that amount of time, and the packet is about an inch and a half thick, so it takes a while. Uh, okay, that's it. Are, are you saying you, you did not get enough beauty sleep or what? <laughs> no, I didn't get beauty sleep. No, it just shows, right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I would never say that. Commissioner Boucher. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank Commissioner Fraser for bringing up the subject and updating us on the fiber. That's extremely important for our business development. And as a lot of us seen, it affected their population on the virtual schooling. So thank you very much. Also, I want to thank Commissioner Wance for taking a moment of prayer for the lost captain. This is a big tragedy for that brotherhood. I know it's going to be very hard emotionally for all the people involved. And a lot of firefighters out there know that at any day this could happen to them. So it is a tremendous loss and it is heartfelt by the firefighting community. So thank you, Commissioner Vance. I want to list off the names of new hirees to the county. Welcome aboard Jennifer Harless, Residential Plans Examiner of Permits and Inspections. Carrie Birch, Program Coordinator, Housing Stability Citizen Services. John Steele, the fourth, paid work experience at Burke. Sanali Shah. Fiscal Coordinator, Citizen Services, welcome aboard. I believe Mr. Swam has some uh, some slides possibly to bring up here for us, but until then, I'm, here we go. We have the Union Mills Corn Roast. Well, this is neat. I didn't even know this was coming. What a wonderful event. I've attended this event a couple times with my parents. It was a tremendous success. <clears throat> I want to uh, give thanks and appreciation to all the volunteers that made this happen. The Boy Scouts were out there, all the people involved with personnel to coordinate this. It took a lot of effort. I think this event kind of personifies the greatness of our community. It's a spirit of commonality, the fact that we have an agricultural-based society. This is a wonderful event, and I'm very grateful to all the people that support in their volunteerism and the people who attend it. Thank you very much, and we look forward to more and more success at this event and highlights the history of our community and agriculture. So thank you very much. Uh, do we have anything else here? Do we have uh, anything on the school? I'll, I'll bring an update on Winfield Elementary. Winfield Elementary in my district is in the process of replacing their HVAC and roof system. I'll let there and, and see that's in process. There's some people concerned. Here we go. Some action photos. When our constituents or my constituents ride by and see the school under construction, they get nervous where everything will be done in time, there are safety issues, but it will. I got an update from Jonathan O'Neill. The HVAC and roof replacement windfield project replaces the existing system with a modern energy efficient system long, along with indoor air quality improvements. The roof was brought forward to concur with the HVAC installation due to concerns with existing roof conditions. There's been a little bit of day on, delay on materials. I think we've all seen dealing with anything over the pandemic and our supply chains. So rest assured that'll take place. And I remember when the school system first shut down a year ago, I was on that roof with the following individuals from the school system. Ray Prochop, Director of Facilities Management, Bill Keene, Facilities Planner, and Jim Marks, Supervisor of Construction. And I'm very grateful to these individuals for staying the course on this and getting it through to improve the quality of the school for our constituents. Also, I quickly mentioned that Union Bridge residents are having a community cookout on August 29th from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. and it's themed Taste of Union Bridge. It will be on East Broadway Street next to the municipal parking lot. So if you get a chance, come out and support Union Bridge. They'd love to have people come and visit and appreciate their town. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Wentz. So a couple things. Um, yeah, I preached. I saw my brother-in-law in that one photo for the corn roast, uh, <laughs> which is a good thing. He was representing my family because uh, Kathy good. and I had a previous commitment that we couldn't get there this year. So did reach out to Sam Riley and the folks up there, and 
I'm glad they had a successful event. Um, unemployment rate, Carroll County is the lowest again in the state at 5.1, which is always a good thing. Um, so that's a positive sign. On the back side of the fact that we still are dealing with COVID and the, the D variant or whatever it is, uh, ever-changing guidelines again, and I'm hoping that folks, uh, instead of attacking one another and making stupid remarks on uh, Facebook and what have you, which you all know what I, how I feel about that, it is the dumpster of our society, and I'll always say that. Uh, Facebook is not what it was meant to be at this point. It was meant to share photos and family, uh, keep up with families. And now it's a, it's a, uh, it's a place where uh, people who hide behind keyboards but won't look in the eye troll every day and say ridiculous things about one another. It's taking our country down into a huge rabbit hole, and I just wish it would stop. But I guess you can't help yourself, and you keep going. So uh, hopefully people will come out of this at some point and get back to the way this country used to be, working together to beat something and not attack one another all the time. Amazes me. Life is short, which is my last bit today for Priority Carroll. Uh, a 21-year veteran uh, right next door um, who lost his life last night, last evening, uh, Captain Josh Laird. Uh, two daughters and a wife, uh, lived in Fairfield, Pennsylvania, and was a career firefighter in Frederick County. Uh, I, think, I think Josh was a paramedic as well, I believe. Not sure. But anyway, um, the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, I say this all the time, you know, these, these, these men and women run into danger while everybody else is running out. Um, and I, I started with the Facebook thing because that's what people do on Facebook. Cowards, cowards. Um, but this is a prime example of the strength of the men and women that are public servants. And um, he, um, he lost his life doing what he loved to do. So, uh, I reached out to everyone in Frederick County. I know, Jack, I think you've reached out, I'm sure. Scott, you're from Frederick County, and they're both in the room in case you're following my, my rant here this morning. Uh, I know they've been uh, in touch. All of us have been in touch. Uh, I, I contacted uh, the county executive. Uh, I also contacted the president of the county council, and I did reach out to uh, Fire Chief Tom Coe, just to give our condolences here in Carroll, and like we all do, uh, offer any assistance that we need to do. Many Carroll companies were engaged in that uh, incident last night. As a matter of fact, my home company, Pleasant Valley, was filling in one of the Frederick County stations for a while. So uh, that's the magnitude of what this uh, of what happened there. So um, maybe people just need to take a minute and stop and take a breath. And stop with the with the the rhetoric and the attacks on one another, and think about the fact that there are people out there sacrificing their lives every single day to keep us safe. And maybe that should stop a lot of you to just shut up and and work with one another to get through this this pandemic. And I think I better stop there, but. All of us have our thoughts and prayers with everybody in Frederick County today. Absolutely, and may his memories be a blessing to his entire family, friends, co-workers, colleagues, <clears throat> and community. And I've often said, you know, like you, the selflessness of the men and women serving in green, blue, and red, um, you know, don't do it for the accolades, do it because of the service they provide and the willingness to go forward when others are going the other direction. So, um, mentioned COVID, I absolutely agree about the uh, vaccinations, 
It ain't gonna come from us, it's gonna come from a neighbor, from a family, from a friend, saying, hey man, get it done. And it's happening. So I just continue to promote that, you know, one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction to get folks vaccinated so we can continue to move in the right direction as we do here in Carroll County. Um, the, uh, the weather is extremely hot. The uh, shelters are open. Um, the senior centers, the libraries, uh, those that can get to them, please get to them if necessary. Those that know someone that needs to, please help out. It's about a community and um, we do not need the impact that this weather can have on folks uh, when somebody has the opportunity to reach out. And it's, um, heat index is gonna be well over hundreds. Uh, yesterday it was, today, and tomorrow I believe, and it should break over the weekend. But um, fortunately we're prepared. Uh, and just, you know, that's, that's my safety message. Uh, typically I would expect Commissioner Wentz to be throwing that one out there, but uh, I got this one about uh, the weather. Um, we went down to Sykesville yesterday, uh, Mr. Zaleski, Ms. Windham and I, to meet with the new mayor. Uh, she's not new to Sykesville. She's a councilwoman that's been there for a couple terms. Now she's the mayor, uh, Mayor Link, and we had a very good conversation on uh, the continuing partnership that we wanna have between Carroll County and Sykesville along with all the other jurisdictions. Um, on a completely different note and a positive note, the Carroll County Fair results, I, I serve on the Ag Board meeting, which is just a lot of fun to serve on. I mean, uh, getting the opportunity, although sometimes they're simple solutions with complex problems that take 30 minutes as opposed to a yes or no, uh, I do enjoy the, um, the bantering going back and forth. The numbers from the County Car Carroll County Fair, $111,000 raised in the cake auction, $942,000 raised in the livestock auction, both crushing the records from uh, previous years. <laughs> Putting it in perspective, and I ain't a farmer, I don't play one on TV or nothing like that, there was 170 kids that were showing pigs at the fair. And that's phenomenal. It's a lot of board. bacon. It's a lot of bacon, but I'm telling you, I mean, it, the, the numbers were staggering about the children that were participating. They were showing, there were, there were kids walking out of the fair with $20,000, you know, in proceeds because of the amount of uh, animals they were showing. Uh, one pig sold for $16,500. Uh, so yeah, the, um, the energy from the community and the fair, I, uh, I just wanted to throw that out there. Did you want to share something? That fair pays yeah. for a lot of colleges and, yeah. uh, college funds from a lot of those things. Uh, people, and a lot of these kids save the money, they buy another project, reinvest and keep going. And a lot of their colleges pay for, uh, through that fair. And by the way, I offered to buy a pig with Commissioner Rostein. I give him the front half. I take the back half, but he wouldn't bite. So, I, I was uh, looking for the kosher pig, and it wasn't out there. So, okay, life is good. Let's keep moving and get to the first topic, and let's talk about chairs. Purchase of ergonomic chairs for the Emergency Communication Center. Uh, Maureen, Scott, and Jack, I think you're all coming up. Uh, and you're going to share with us the price tag, but more importantly, the requirement and importance of these uh, chairs inside the Emergency Communication Center. So, uh, Maureen, did you want to kick it off? Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Um, we are requesting your approval to purchase 22 Iron Horse ergonomical office chairs from the United Group Incorporated in the amount of $38,812.48. <coughs> Um, these chairs are going to be purchased from a GS, off of a GSA contract. Um, this contract does include a cooperative purchasing clause um, for local governments, and um, the budget has approved uh, these, the cost for these chairs, and I will turn it over to Scott and Jack um, to have them talk to you about the chairs themselves. Thanks. 
Good morning, commissioners. The only the only comment I'd like to add, and then if you have <clears> questions <throat> about the specific chairs, I'm sure Jack can answer those. Is this is uh, this would be purchased using funds offered by the Maryland 911 board. So if you were to proceed, we would ask be asking you to accept those funds and then to award the purchase. So this is not a county born expense. This is a Maryland 911 board expense and uh, a request that Jack had made previously as we've done in the past. And it's part of what we're here today for is to ask you to accept those funds and make the purchase. I love using other people's money. <clears throat> okay. Any questions, Good comments? Point. It's technically our money. It's technically our money. You you pay for it when you use your cell phone. Just saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, Mr. Wayne, you've had to sit in this position, and I'm sure you can testify to how important it is to have a good chair. You you want to expand on that, Jack? Sort butts. Go ahead. I don't care. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. I, when I started, it was much like your days. We got the leftover chairs that that everyone yep. else in the county. Um, was getting rid of yeah. um, the last time we purchased chairs was in 2016 uh, the numbers board uh, funds the chairs every four years um, so we're already five years behind um, uh, uh, 12 of these chairs are for the additional positions that we just uh, did through the renovation um, 10 are replacements um, they are 24 7 high intensive use mm -hmm. um, they're weight rated um, for the 500 pounds um, you know and you know these folks are sitting in these chairs for 12 hours or more at a time um, so they are they are a quality chair for for those individuals are the um, those chairs being replaced are they going to be uh, provided throughout the county or are they being turned in what the current that? chairs are in various stages of disrepair so okay. we are trying to make some uh, repairs to them under, uh -huh. the, under the current warranty uh -huh. um, and any chairs that become surplus if they're if they're usable and safe that they will be um, put in surplus for anybody else to use yep I could give a rat's patoot what you do with them you can throw them in a dumpster as far as I care <laughs> I make the uh, motion that we accept <laughs> the funding offered by 911 board and award the purchase of 22 ergonomic office chairs to United Group in the amount of $38,812.48. Second. Okay, I got a motion and second. Any further conversation, discussion? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, Aye. go buy your chairs. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Okay, let's talk uh, utilities code, chapter 51, sewer and water. And we're gonna have, uh, deal with the water and sewer rate schedule. Jason and Andy, gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Morning, Commissioner. Good morning. So we're here before you today for Chapter 51 and the water and sewer rate schedule to kind of uh, look for your authorization to proceed to public hearing. Uh, the Bureau of Utilities has reviewed the reference topic and is recommending administrative and language changes throughout. These recommendations will enhance the Bureau's operation will allow staff to move forward with updating policies. The recommended changes were presented to a committee consisting of business owners, commercial property operators, and citizens. Additional feedback was given by the group, with specific items being incorporated in the final document with a goal of accuracy and fairness throughout the code. In doing so, the committee took a balanced approach when reviewing the chapter and making recommendations. As an enterprise fund, the fund is designed for users to pay their share of the infrastructure used and services provided. The committee used this concept as a basis for the proposal, for the proposals before you today. Um, I wanna thank uh, Fred Gossage. Um, he is a committee member from the Freedom District, the Sykesville area, and actually Fred is here. Um, if you have any specific questions for him, um, he can certainly uh, is be more willing to answer those. Uh, Bruce Reamer, also from the Freedom District, the Eldersburg area. Rob Smith from the Pleasant Valley area. And then Bill Wance, who was a former Utility Advisory Council member, was also on the committee. So we'll start on page five. <clears throat> and what you know, you'll see uh, throughout this document, there are a lot of changes. Um, this this uh, document hasn't been updated for 20 years. Um, with Andy and I being somewhat new to the department, we uh, have seen things through the course of our first couple years involved with utilities. Um, this is kind of the document that we refer to with the work that we that we do and we just saw some things in here that we thought needed updated so um, on, I have about 15 items that I want to kind of discuss and highlight there are other items within the code if you have questions about them feel free to ask them on page 5 
uh, I'm sorry, page four, 51.03, we added some additional definitions to provide clarification uh, within the document. When, when reading through this, um, you know, several things came to mind uh, by me is what exactly does area connection charge mean? Mm -hmm. um, and I think definitions are very important things to have in the code for a starting point for, for, for users. So we added some additional clarification there. Uh, on page 5, 5115, we added language to allow the county to re-review construction documents should a project not move forward after two years of approval. This will ensure any changes to current standards are incorporated in projects that are not being actively pursued after two years. So we run into issues um, occasionally where projects set for many years, more than two, um, sometimes, you know, three, four, five years. And standards change, things change. Um, and while it could be minor, um, one thing within the code, um, we feel that it'd be important for us to have an opportunity to review it and work with the contractor through that submittal process to update it to the current standard or maybe not quite meet that current standard, but get something a little better than what they previously approved. So we would work with that particular customer to, uh, to resolve that issue. On page nine, 5118, require the area connection charges to be based on the actual estimated water usage and not solely based on the meter size. Uh, we have a lot of account holders who uh, pay for a two inch area connection fee but they're really using a four, six, eight inch uh, amount of water. Mm. So what we'd like to do, and you'll see this later on in this document and in the um, water and sewer mm -hmm. rate schedule, what we'd like to do is incorporate a rate schedule um, one through 12 and not base it on the meter size, base it solely on the amount of water that's being proposed to use. So if a new customer comes in with a project, they, we have a, a manual that'll tell us how much water they use. Their engineer can provide us uh, documented data as to how much they expect to use and then we work with them to come up with a kind of a basic number of what we think um, how much water they're going to use in a given uh, daily basis um, with some operations that changes uh, we have some operations that might uh, uh, come in as an, an eight-hour shift well as they move into their their business model and they expand business they might have two eight-hour shifts well that essentially doubles the amount of water they use um, and the county was not compensated for that through the area connection fee process. So we're looking to build a, a, a somewhat of an audit system within that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through this. On page 10, uh, in instances where the system is expanded for development purposes, require the area connection only to be charged to area areas outside of the developed PWA when the connection is requested. The front foot benefit assessment would regard would apply regardless of the connection. So in this particular section right now, currently, if a developer wants to develop a piece of property and they have to run a water or sewer line from point A to point B, anybody who abuts that proper abuts that line, that new line that's run, is required to connect. No if, ands, or buts about it. That's how the code is written currently. Um, and that's been the prior practice of of the Bureau of Utilities. What we are proposing is that we would not require them to connect to pay that essentially, I think it's eighteen or $20,000 area connection fee. Um, not require them to connect, but require them just to pay the front foot benefit assessment, which is an assessment paid for um, maintenance of that line that abuts their property. So in the past, they'd be required to pay the front foot benefit and the area connection. With this proposal, we, we We'd not, we would not require them to make the actual connection. It would be there for them at a future date, and if they decide to connect, then at that point they would pay the area connection. Deputy Director Green, if I may, what would that financial liability be for that residency or property? You're taking it from a higher level. What would it drop, the cost drop down to? It depends on how many feet of pipe is run along that property. Um, it's roughly about, I think it's 90 some cents for uh, uh, per foot for a water line and 90 some cents for a sewer line. So roughly $2 uh, per foot. So um, it could it be over a thousand? What, how much savings are we giving to constituents? Well, the savings will be on the area connection fee mm -hmm. itself. So it's roughly in the 18, 18 to $20,000 20, $20, range. That's good news. That's correct. But so is there a rough estimate of what potentially the liability would be left when they 
the, what's the cost that okay. they would have? So if, as an example, if I own a lot that is 50 foot um, in dimension, and that water line or sewer line runs along that property, then that 50 just multiply that that's out. a multiplier, okay. that's correct. It's a substantial yep. savings. I appreciate you guys being proactive. Was this brought forth because of constituents concerns, complaints? What motivates you to do this? This is a good thing. Yeah. I'm wondering, are we reacting positively to our constituents with this? Yeah, this, this is not a reaction that we've heard about. It's something that through internal staff we've, we've, we saw and it, it, in our opinion, we don't think it's really fair to make people connect. Um, there are a lot of people out there who have trouble coming up with that amount of funds. And, um, you know, if they have good viable systems, um, you know, that are operating in accordance with health department standards, then that uh, it should be an option for them. Uh, I think this is wonderful and I appreciate staff doing this. Now, this is in uh, line to um, the MAKO two years ago uh, <clears throat> um, when I was on that one subcommittee with Commissioner Wance about uh, sanitation, you know, uh, dealing with the different systems and the frustration that people were showing about these hookup fees. Um, not just here in Carroll County, I mean, we're talking the whole mm -hmm. state, and and the state was trying to mandate these type of fees, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I was very strong advocate that we don't mandate because exactly what you said, so I appreciate this. How many, um, you know, rough magnitude properties in the county are we talking about that, um, where sewer lines are going near where we're now saying you don't have to hook them. I mean, is it, are we talking, you know, a hundred? Are we talking a thousand? I mean, is there a, a sense? Uh, I don't have a sense of that. I mean, yeah. it, 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 again, previously those properties were required to connect. Yeah. So I'm not exactly sure if that was a, when that standard went into right. place and whether there were properties before that that weren't required. I don't okay. know that. But uh, this would be for any new development coming in. So okay. those properties that are not associated with the development wouldn't be penalized for that development coming into their neighborhood. Got it. The um, survey that was done by the free, at the Freedom District uh, that uh, Ms. Eisenberg uh, sent around and got responses back, did you use any of that or was that considered understanding the... Yeah, we didn't use any of that data okay. as far as okay. our, our process. We, we okay. actually started this process over a year ago yeah um covid kind of threw us off a little bit and that's sure. why we're a little bit longer getting here but uh we haven't we haven't analyzed that data it'd be yet. interesting to see the survey results that she received and how it marries up with this i think we're going to find that it marries up very well with this so okay and, so, and, and, go ahead the, the 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 survey was also if i recall correctly was was based upon the, the isolated island areas that, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, did not have service available to them. It, the, 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 the survey was based upon if, if sewer service was available, was made available, right. how would you feel? Right. So, so we're, we're, it's slightly different here as, okay. as far as the code okay. change goes. I get you. Thanks. And yeah, I'll just make the point, this also doesn't put us in a position where someone who may have um, uh, made some repairs or updates to their existing uh, septic system and then a few years later, a line's run down along their property through no fault of their own, and they have to connect, and there's lost funds there as well. So we just thought it was a good idea to kind of go in, in this route. And we think, from our perspective, you know, we have the funds available to maintain that pipe in front of them. They're, they would still pay that front foot benefit, so I think we're still in, still in good shape. Well, I have to ask you then, you want them to pay the front foot benefit? That's correct. Right. Well, my question is, they're not using the pipe. Why should they pay to maintain it? Uh, the pipe is there available for them to connect. There is value in the, I, I there is increased part, value in the in the property with having that pipe available for them to connect. But we thought we thought it was a good trade off to negate the the area connection charge while still maintaining the minimal charge for the upkeep of that pipe. Well, I mean, I agree about the connection charge. I do 100% agree about that. But if I'm the property owner, I got a pipe that's now put in front of my property that I have nothing to do with, but I have to pay to maintain it. I. I I don't know. It's just, I, I don't think it's a good idea. I think you might get some pushback on that one. Yeah, again, that's current. Yeah, current I understand. Standard now. I just uh, think so, it, we, you know, we took the position that we are reducing that burden on that particular citizen. That's the position we took. Uh, we still have to maintain that pipe, um, yeah, just like every other pipe. Yeah, but you're not maintaining it for them. 
they're not using it at all, which is my point. I don't, I don't think they should have to pay, in my opinion, mm -hmm. I don't think they should have to pay to maintain the pipe that they're not going to use. Now, if they connect to it in the future, then all that comes, comes into play. But if you run a, a pipe in front of my house, the number one I didn't ask for because of no development or whatever the reason is, and that's all good, but why should I have to pay to maintain it? I don't have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Fraser made an extremely good point, and I'm all behind what he's stating there. What could we do to alleviate that potentially? Could we put that expense onto the initiator of the pipe running through? Could we backload the charge eventually if someone hooks up? I mean, what type of options would we have? Because I think Commissioner Fraser made a very good point. Those citizens, even though they're saved money from the hookup, it feels unjustifiable upon them, if I'm correct in understanding Commissioner Frazier, that they are having an unjust burden placed upon them to maintain a pipeline to benefit someone down the road, especially if that is a development. And a developer is causing that citizen to accrue an expense that's unnecessary. So I think that was a wonderful point. And there's, is there any way we could potentially explore how to resolve that and be a little bit more fair? Yeah, we can certainly explore it and come back uh, before you and, and give you some options that we, we might think of. I think it'd be good. I think it'd be fair to our, our constituents as well. Mm -hmm. Mr. Frazier, thank you very much for bringing that point up. Yeah, if you could look into that and bring it back to us, I'd really appreciate that. Sure. Uh, on page 11. Uh, I have to say, our pages aren't numbered up here. <laughs> Tell me what section it is. I'm, I'm going to uh, if you going, follow the screen. As he I'm goes down, he hits yeah. it. Yeah, I would just yeah, read from screen. the. Yeah, I'm trying to follow it. I'm doing my best. But we ahead. don't have numbers. Go ahead. <laughs> so this will be 51.19A. Uh, okay. We are right here. So this allows the establishment of a plan to audit area connection fees at commercial sites. So this gets back to what I was referencing earlier, where um, we would we would audit commercial sites to, to verify that their water usage aligns with their area connection charge. Um, you'll see later on in the document, we haven't prepared any sort of plan yet for that. Um, we just kind of established in the groundwork at this point within the ordinance, and then we would establish kind of an, a, a policy uh, with your approval of how we would go about that audit uh, process. <laughs> on the next page, 51, dot 20 B uh, removes the credit for basement grinder pumps um, and that's not needed since we're not requiring them to connect so that's why we're re removing that out of the code so it's just consistent with, consistent with other sections so that was on page 14 uh, 12 we'll move to page 14 51.22 uh, this is simply remove, removing the customer service section as the Bureau of Utilities. The Comptroller's Office provides this function, um, and it's really, in our opinion, it's really not needed. I mean, folks know that they can just call either the Bureau of Utilities or the, com the Comptroller's Office if they have a billing question. It's not really needed in code. So that's just a little bit of a cleanup. Page 16, 51. Uh, I'm sorry, 5122G, G1, increased the after-hours reinstatements of service fee from $90 to $125. So this would be for um, folks who do not pay their utility bill mm -hmm. and they go online and pay it after hours, then we have to call in staff to go out and turn their water on. So we run into this sometimes, you know, Fridays or Saturdays or whenever. Um, not real convenient for our staff and economical uh, budget-wise, so we feel that it's necessary to really raise that fee up to $125. Page 16. On the same page, 5124, Table 1, we updated the water usage classification, expanding billing schedule to allow for more gradual rates added and added age-restricted language in the code. So you'll see on the next page is the majority uh, section of that table. We are removing the um, referenced portion for the meter size. Again, it's all about the, the actual, how many gallons they're using per day. So you'll see a one through 12 in that section. We wanna use that as our rate model, one through 12. 
Um, within that model, we currently have nine, actually. We want to add numbers six, seven, and eight. And the reason we want to add those is we run into an issue with the gap between what previously was a two inch meter, which is now rate five, and a three inch meter, which I think that's actually rate eight, maybe. Is that correct? I believe you're right. I think, I think you're I'm right, yeah. Actually, uh, number nine, number six, seven, and nine should be the ones highlighted. Mm -hmm. Apologize for that. So we run into an issue where um, rate five and rate eight have a huge gap between them at 725 gallons per day versus 2,250 gallons per day. So what happens is if we have someone come in at 1,000 gallons per day or 1,200 gallons per day, they automatically got bumped up to the three inch schedule, mm -hmm. which you can see, you'll see on the rate schedule, it's an enormous charge difference. So what we wanna do as an economic development tool is build in three additional layers of rates to kind of have a more gradual step in there. So that's our purpose with that particular change. You also see at the bottom of that chart, uh, we wanna include an increased area connection charge to apply for um, all those accounts that use a thousand gallons or more over the 12, number 12 rate. So for example, the number 12 rate currently now goes up to 7,250 gallons per day. We have some users that might be using 30 gallons, 30,000 gallons per day. Well, they're not paying for that additional infrastructure that we build in because our rate schedule only goes up to that top rate. So we wanna build in a mechanism that for every thousand dollars you go above that, it's a, scaled, it's a scaled system and just build that into the, the rate schedule. And we'll talk about that more on the, on the rate schedule discussion. Uh, we also added in this particular section, you'll see an exception to age restricted communities 55 and older, receive a 60% 60, 60 reduction to rate one of each rate schedule. Um, that's something that was uh, created as an internal policy many years ago. We wanna officially codify that in the code just to make sure it's clear and it's, it's everybody understands it. Is uh, 60%, I mean, why 60, it's arbitrary it's based off of what their usage is. So we, back when this was created, there were calculations done as to the average residential okay. uh, one and two family dwelling okay. and how that usage compared to uh, a senior housing. And it was roughly 60% less okay. than what they used. Got it. Well, I have to ask a question then. <laughs> Let's say I don't live in one of those communities, but my usage is 60% of the other people. Can I get that rate, rate, rate reduction as well? Because why shouldn't I? <laughs> No, that's not that's not how we're I know, that's not how it works. <laughs> yes. I? Yeah. yeah, I think just because I mean there's a lot of people yeah. what uh, age yeah. that <laughs> want to stay in their homes when they get older instead of moving to one of these other communities using less water, why shouldn't they get the rate reduction as well? Yeah, the challenging thing would be tracking all that. You well, have right, but you could have them call. I mean if, if I was interested I saw this, okay, I'm I'm in that age group. Uh, if I wanted to I use a little bit less water. I call you up. Can you track my water? And if it's if it's six percent less, then you can say, "Sorry, it's not. You use way too much water." <laughs> okay, I'm fine right. with that. But if I use that, why should I get the rate? Yeah, again, it's a it's the tracking mechanism because um, you know that could be incorporated for you. You might sell your house in three months, and then we're dealing with a, a residence okay. of four. Okay. So that with the age sense. restricted, okay. it's pretty restricted that you know they it's only really a two-person household gotcha. if, in that effect. So that, right. it'd be a, just a tracking nightmare for staff. Mm -hmm. All right, when you brought up selling the house, I, I understand completely now, okay. Uh, Jason, I do have just one question. Do you have to hook up to sewer and water, or can you hook up to water and only sewer? Do, you, do people have that option? We have accounts that are either or or both. It just okay. really depends on the specific. I mean, in the Freedom area, apparently, they have some <laughs> issues with uh, septic systems yeah. failing, and. So people may want to not hook up to the water yet, but they want to hook up to the subject. Yeah, essentially, if both are available, then the current code requires them to connect to both. Hmm. I believe that's accurate. Cur that's currently, accurate. currently yeah. they'd have to connect to both if Correct. both are in front of their, you know, Correct. go by their property. But you're right, there are plenty of places across the county um, that are on 
either just sewer right. or just water, yeah. um, just because that's the way it was. I mean, yeah, we my, have my personal home, for example. I just have city, county water, and I have a septic system. So, hmm. yeah, we have some folks in Hampstead that have are just connected to our our sewer system, but mm -hmm. not they're not connected. They have their own well. Right. So, just um, going back to where Commissioner Frazier was asking understanding it may be a staffing nightmare um to track i just asked just take a look at that you know um you know what good because there still may be um a good benefit for the community and understanding what the what the needs may be from staffing if it is too much then got it but that's also a potential look at okay what would it take for staff to be able to do this, you know, if this is the right, a solution that should be looked at. And I think, you know, there's uh, there's potential there. I mean, we gotta remember the customer is the community. And, uh, you know, although we may not have the staffing to do it, let's focus on the customer and then figure mm -hmm. out, do we have the staffing or how do we adjust appropriately? Yeah, and I'll just make a point, um, you know, for every action, there's a reaction. Right. So we are enterprise funds. So anything we save somewhere else, right. we save the constituents somewhere else, may may result in increased cost to them else in other areas, because of it because it is an enterprise fund. So just wanted to make that point. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want page uh, the same page. Uh, we talked about the uh, the front foot benefit to be charged regardless of connection to the system, mm -hmm. um, and we we were re uh, retaining this since we are eliminating the requirement to connect. In the area connection charge. But and again, we're looking we can, into that now. Pardon me? But we're looking into that. That's now. correct. Okay. That's correct. <laughs> yep. On uh, the next page, 5124, uh, requires a permit, a plumbing permit, in order to be considered for payment credit due to a leak. So we have uh, some folks that um, claim that they had a water leak, they want credit on their bill. Um, we'll look into that. A lot of cases, they may or may not have a plumbing permit. What we want to do is codify that and require them to get a plumbing permit so we can ensure, number one, there, were, there was a repair that was made. And number two, the repair was made correctly. On the same page, 5124C1, outlines the billing of a meter if an owner claims the meter is inaccurate and testing determines it, it to be accurate. So this is just a, a, a way for us to um, ensure that if we go out there on a false claim and we perform some work and it's not deemed that it's on our side that the county that service is compensated for that for that work uh, the same page 51.24 c2 adds a property transfer fee to provide a final meter reading so currently right now if someone goes to transfer a piece of property we get a I think it's, I guess it's like a ticket that will send our staff out to do a final reading so that payment can be made by the, the seller. We don't charge for that particular uh, service. So we want to add a, I think it's, what is it, a $30, $30. a $30 fee for that service. Do you, I mean, are you adding these fees because um, there is a history of folks doing this and it's just taking too much of our resources away from other things or um, I mean again not to say 30 well is $30 arbitrary uh, and why $30 um, the way I'm reading this is I feel like it's almost Comcast Xfinity coming out saying we can do this we can do that this is what's going to charge this is what I'm like wait a second you know what's knowing yep. that the community is the is the customer yep, absolutely you know? so yeah, what, what's, what's driving it again yeah. is the, the enterprise fund aspect in that the customer pays for the service or for the product that you're giving them. Right. And really only the customer should pay that, not another customer. So in this essence, we're providing a service um, to this particular homeowner that's not incorporated in our current fee schedule. Um, it's just been a customary service we've provided. The, 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 the reason the, the fee is low at $30 is right. that this is going to happen during normal business hours. We have staff in the area, so it's a quick go out, read the meter, and right. then report that back and then to Andy's office staff, and then that gets reported upstairs um, as part of the final reading. 
So it's just a process that, that we feel. And again, part of it is to help eliminate other stresses on the system, uh, rates on your water usage. Mm -hmm. You know, the more we can develop a system that um, ties to the user pays, the better it is for the people who don't use those type right. of services and then therefore don't have their rates increase on a right. on a month on a, a, a quarterly basis and the, and the, I appreciate that and the um, big the, the overarching is the difference between taxes and fees you know and these are fees for users using this system not taxes and you know where others are paying for this is kind of where you're getting to correct it's individual fees so okay uh, and, have, and the fee was based on, on approximately 30 minutes of staff time. So that, oh, is that what it, okay. It, it was based on actual staff okay. time. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing the motivation behind this and what your goal is because that clearly, what you just did was clearly articulated to our constituents what's motivating this. And I think that's a very fair thing that you're doing, and I appreciate it. All right, so that's all I have for the actual uh code document itself um, we'll move right to the um, actual rate schedule and again you'll see um, a few things that we are looking to delete one is the hookup charge that that terminology is not used anymore that's the uh, fourth column in from the left on both the sewer and water schedule uh, we're also proposing to eliminate the meter size again tie everything to the gallons per day We are adding additional rates solely on the water usage with lines six, seven, and nine on both the water and sewer side of things. At the bottom of that page, we are adding the uh, increased area connection charge. Um, and this, this section specifically spells out what the charge is, because as you all know, you adopt this particular rate schedule um, by resolution. So we didn't include the amount within the code because it's really part of this rate schedule. So what we'd be proposing is um, for every additional thousand over rate 12, the 18,000 in water and 18,000 would sewer would kick in and they are half rates from what we currently charge. And then the last part of that uh, below in notes, uh, we're also wanted to just make this part of the discussion that uh, all rates are adjusted to the consumer price index mm -hmm. in even years, so that'd be every even fiscal year, starting in fiscal year 24. So the reason we're kind of bringing this to you, as you know, mm -hmm. rates are always um, are the main driver of what we can and can do within the Bureau of Utilities. And to not consistently um, be behind the eight ball, we'd like to have some sort of price index built into, into our rate schedule so we basically just keeping up with the cost of inflation and then if at any point we felt that we needed additional funds for uh, other projects that maybe don't have enough money or new projects then at that point we would come before the board and request um, a an additional rate modification to the schedule but this will be just keeping up and just as an example I looked at both uh, 2019 and 2020 the CPI rating was between one and two percent um, and that's pretty typical for year to year. You might have some that are a little bit higher, um, but most mostly it's a one or two percent. Mm -hmm. So that would be built into the rate schedule on a uh, even year basis, even fiscal year basis. I'm I'm impressed that you looked at that because I think it's been an ongoing theme with fees that we need to link ourselves to the inflationary index so that we don't fall so far behind. So I'm I'm glad you've done this. So. We wouldn't be sitting stagnant. I think what we addressed two years ago, the fact their rates were from the 1990s or something, and there was no mechanism in place to stop that from happening. So I'm sure this is precisely what we need as far as a mechanism to prevent that from happening. Thank you. So with that, that closes out the, my presentation. I uh, was here before you to request permission to go to public hearing. Um, if you want to delay that until I get some information back to you on those other two topics, we can uh, come back before you, um, or I can provide that supplementary and have it ready for open session. Okay. Um, Jason, one, one, one brief statement, yeah, please, if I may. Sure. Uh, the, these proposed changes have, have no impact financially on any of the current users. This, this, <laughs> the, the, there's absolutely no change of, of, of any cost to them at this point in time. Okay. So. Um, Fred, thanks for being here. Uh, 
you have, well, I mean, you're, you're here. Would you like to make any uh, comments? Yes, uh, couple of them. I apologize. Come on up to the mic. Okay, Just sure. uh, state Johnson, your name. And primarily Sykesville, Maryland. Yep. The one thing is with the area charge, I'm pro, pro consumer. But I would disagree with you, Dennis, on that fee. That fee is a great insurance policy because my parents had a home. They had an older septic system. Their septic system failed when that house was sold. They cost $42,000 to upgrade it to a new septic system. Now we have that line running in front. I would have loved to have that opportunity. Yeah. To me, that's an insurance policy for that consumer to say, hey, you're only talking about 90 cents, I think, a foot per line. I think you should cap it at maybe 100 or 200 foot road frontage. If somebody has a 1,000 foot of road frontage, they shouldn't be penalized. But that's a great insurance policy because at any time when their septic system or water fails, they can hook up to that city water and what is that's invaluable because before they wouldn't have the option. So, I mean, yeah, we can have to go back and forth, but no, I'm just saying, I just yeah, I didn't know yeah, if anybody if brought the, that up. If the pipe is running in front of their house anyway, even if they're not paying the fee, they can still hook up to it if they needed it. Oh, no, I'm, I'm just saying that fee would be to me if I was yeah. a property and I am a property owner, I would gladly pay that fee because I'm looking at it as that's something that I can hook up to later. I mean, that's just that's just one person's opinion. But, Okay. 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 Second thing is, this is going to be very, very good for the business community wanting to come into our county. The way the system's written now is anti new growth. Let me explain to you why. You take an old building, which I've done plenty of times in Sykesville, it has a three quarter inch line coming in. The proposed use has not changed at all, but you're going to do the right thing. You're going to pull a building permit. You pull the building permit. When you do that, they say, oh, you've got to sprinkle the building because that's now the new code. I understand that that's fire safety. I was a volunteer firefighter. The, the, the pro or the anti-business comes in is I, as a business property owner, would have to pass that on to the new business coming in. And the only way that I would go to that higher usage, that large, large fee, is if my fire sprinkler went off, which happens very, very seldom. So here you have a property, let's say, that uses water at a three-quarter inch line. They continue to use a three-quarter inch line, no increase in cost but I would have a $66,000 bill facing me because I have to put a sprinkler system in because it was based on the meter size, not the usage size. Now on the flip side of that, I have some other commercial buildings that my fees are gonna go up, but I think that's fair because we're using more water. It's all based on usage instead of just that meter size that says, oh, you arbitrarily are gonna pay that big increase because we put fire suppression systems in your building, which wasn't really and we've lost some businesses that way because we've got to pass that cost on somewhere. Mm -hmm. And we've lost small mom and pop mercantile shops saying, whoa, I'm, I'm, I don't need a sprinkler. Well, yeah, but you got to have it because that's the, that's the state code. You have to have it. So with that regards, I think it's going to be a lot fair and it's going to bring small mom and pop businesses in that are using a three quarter inch line or a one inch line and they don't need to go to that three inch connection charge. They're going to be based on the usage. Now on the flip side, if we put a restaurant in one of those buildings, yeah, the fee's gonna go up because they're using more water. Right. And that's more than fair. This, to me, is a much fairer way after we tweak some things when we were in the committees. Now, I, I appreciate that insight a lot. Um, okay. As probably a new restaurant will be coming into Sykesville yes. on the corner, so uh, it does give opportunities. It does, a lot of opportunities no, for people that would, were before were blocked out of that opportunity. Really, that's, that's really good messaging. So, uh, any other comments? Thoughts. I, I appreciate your, uh, um, Fred, your uh, participation in this, um, along with uh, Bruce and the others. You know that, you know, try and get this right. And no, uh, thank you all for the good package. job you all do. So, appreciate thanks. you. Okay. Which Any is, other? Which yeah, is please. the very reason why this shouldn't be held up. It should go to public hearing. It. But there's no need to hold this up for this couple things. I mean, I completely disagree with your aspect on that. I agree that, that that's an insurance. <clears throat> policy and I, I wish I had that at my house I never will but I wish I did um, so the public will will speak if that's if that's what they want to hear and remember the public was involved in these in these changes anyway um, you mentioned a couple other people there that were involved so you've already gotten to that point to a certain extent if you will so so I think we should, I think we should roll with it. I uh, I have a tendency to agree with Dennis though on this. I, I know that's strange, Dennis, but um, uh, you know, 
if the developer comes in and puts lines in, that's on them. The, the person shouldn't have to pay for those lines until they hook up on them. And, you know, I know well, Right now they got to pay to hook up automatically, so we're backing off of that anyway. We're backing off that, so if they put the lines in, that person, when they want to, they have the right to, but right now, uh, you know, they haven't asked for anything, <coughs> and they're being charged. But uh, right now, they'd have to hook up to it. You're right now, they have to hook up it. to it, but hopefully this goes through. They won't have to hook up to it, but they shouldn't have to pay for those lines until they hook up to <coughs> it. I mean, they didn't ask for any of this. This is just an increased burden on those people until mm -hmm. they want or need that service. So you're suggesting we hold up the public hearing because of that detail? Why, why wouldn't this come? Why wouldn't this it come could out be changed during public in, hearing? Into we the public could just. Hearing. I would like to get the information on that, regardless of how this discussion goes. Yeah, yeah I mean, we can provide you that right. information. We can provide you options at the open so, hearing, and then you can discuss it and okay. decide but which you, option was, you would like to go down. And I don't want to cut you off, Commissioner Weaver. I'm sorry if I did, but you're not losing any insurance at all. Insurance being that the fact that you could hook up to that line because the lines in front of your property you could always hook up to it if you want to pay the connection fee and then you don't have to pay the maintenance fee for however many years are out there that you're not using the line that's the only thing I'm saying that line is there it's run for a development it's run for somebody down the street for whatever reason it's run it goes in front of your house why should you have to pay a maintenance fee on that line if you're not using it it doesn't insure you of anything to pay that maintenance fee because that lines in front of your house, if your pump fails or your well fails or whatever fails, you can then pay the connection fee, which is no longer a hookup fee, it's called connection charge, connection charge to hook up to that. And however many years you didn't use that, you don't have to pay that money. I don't know who would be against that. I I'm just, two people here. but, but my, my thought is, why wouldn't this come out uh, no, during yeah, public hearing? So, so yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to delay the public hearing. Okay. I'm not trying to okay. do that. Okay. But I just want to have that information out there Absolutely. for the public hearing. It's just m ensure that. That's all. I'm not trying to delay anything. I think that's a good compromise. Uh, you clarified it very well. Okay. Any further discussion? I think we're to where we are. Uh, I move the board direct staff to proceed to public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 51. And water and sewer rate schedule. Second. I got a motion. I got a second. Is there any further discussion? This was a very good discussion. Again, Fred, mm -hmm. thank you, and, and please pass our uh, appreciation to the entire team that was put together. Uh, seeing who none. All in favor? Uh, aye. 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 I vote. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent work. Okay, Maureen, you get to come back up. Andy, you get to sit in place. Sampling, right. testing, and reporting services for the Freedom District Water Treatment Plant. Maureen? Okay. We are here to request your approval to award a contract for water sampling, laboratory testing, and reporting services for the Freedom District Water Treatment Plant to the Maryland Environmental Service in the amount of $25,839. And 50 cents. Um, this proposed work is within the adopted budget and we should not need any additional funds. And Andy can answer any of your questions. Gentlemen, very briefly, the, the, this request is for a continuation of the work that has been, been provided by Maryland Environmental Services for the sampling and testing and reporting services for the Freedom Water Treatment Plant since 2018. Uh, and, and MES uh, does similar work for numerous other treatment plants and jurisdictions throughout the state of Maryland. MES is very, is very familiar with the Maryland Department of the Environment's mandated testing and reporting re requirements and will continue to ensure that all testing parameters and reporting tasks meet or exceed these requirements. Freedom Water Plant staff interact with MES on a routine basis and are fully in, in the know with respect to the sampling and testing results and these services will allow plant staff to focus on the day-to-day -day operational challenges of the water plant. Any questions for me? <coughs> No, pretty straightforward to me. I mean, we're giving the MES opportunity. <laughs> uh, I mean. Yeah, I don't think, I, I mean, it's needed, so. Yeah. I'll move the Board of Commissioners award a contract for water sampling, laboratory testing, and reporting services for the Freedom District Water Treatment Plant in Maryland, Envi oh, two, excuse me, Maryland Environmental Services, 
or service in the amount of $25,839.50. Second. I got a motion second. Anything to be said on this one? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, now let's talk about Hampstead. Okay, we are here to um, get your approval to award a contract for affluent sampling, laboratory testing, and reporting services for the Hampstead Wastewater Treatment Plant to, again, Maryland Environmental Services in the amount of $40,754. And again, this is within the proposed budget. Gentlemen, we'll, once again, this request is for a continuation of, of the work performed by Maryland Environmental Services for the testing, sampling, and reporting services for the Hampstead Wastewater Treatment Plant's effluent discharge. These services were e initiated in 2020 as the Hampstead plan transitioned to the more complicated ENR reporting and testing requirements. A a as you heard in the previous item, uh, MES does provide similar services for dozens of, of other water and wastewater treatment plants throughout the uh, state and the region, including the, the uh, county's Freedom Water Treatment Plant, the uh, BTR site in Hampstead, and the state's Freedom w w Wastewater Treatment Plant. MES has, has dedicated staff for these services and is very, very familiar with the Maryland Department of the Environment's mandated testing and, and reporting requirements. This scope of work also includes uh, uh, critical assistance with the renewal of the plant's MDE discharge permit. Th this permit will be more complicated than, <coughs> than that of the past uh, with, with the ENR treatment aspects as well as the dual discharge points to both Piney Run and Deep Run. And, and, and once again, these services will allow plant staff to uh, focus on the challenges of fully learning and, and operating the new ENR treatment uh, processes. Just one question on this, Andy. Um, you know, these two samplings are $65,000 a year, basically. Mm -hmm. Why do we outsource this? Would it be possible to do it in-house, or is this, you have, what the reasoning behind we, it? We certainly, we certainly could. The, 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 the plants, both plants would uh, then suffer as far as, far as uh, uh, man manpower uh, staffing go. The, the, the Hampstead plant itself only has three people assigned to it. Um, uh, w w once you see the upgrade plant, you'll be amazed at the increase in size. And it, it's the, the, the time saving aspect is, is the uh, big, big benefit with, with outsourcing this uh, service. Okay, uh, one thing I would like to see, um, as we get into this in the sampling, somewhere six months into it, I'd, lo I'd love to see the results of the samplings and how we are, how this is working uh, for the treatment plant, uh, you know. Uh, the actual test results. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're just approving the sampling, but usually the reporting of that we never see. I'd like to see how, okay. how this is working uh, for this. Uh, I know DNR has been sampling deep run um, this year. I guess they're doing a baseline uh, in that area now. So I, I just like to see the results of some of You will be pleasantly uh, very happy w with, yeah. with the ENR uh, enhancements at, at the treatment plant. The, 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 uh, test was, the, the test values have, have shown very nice progress compared to the old plant. Okay. I'd like to say that. I like the idea of a third party coming in doing a sampling because it, I think, gives more confidence to the consumer. Because if we're sampling our own yeah. stuff, I mean, not that we would do that, but you yeah. know, other people have <laughs> yeah. okayed it when it really wasn't okay. Third party comes in, I think, just gives more, more, more uh, confidence to that. Also, how often are, are these samples taken? Is this a monthly, weekly, daily, yearly? Primarily what? weekly. Weekly. Uh, okay. Some more just, monthly, just but curious. primarily weekly. Yeah. I'm just asking the question. That's all. Just no, it's, it's, no, it's a good question. I, I, I'd like the third party also. It, uh, confidence is very important to the community when it, when they're putting water in their mouth. So. Yeah, it's kind of like an audit, so to speak. I think Commissioner Fraser made a good point. So, okay. And with that, I move the uh, Board of Commissioners work uh, contract for effluent sampling, laboratory testing, reporting services for the Hampstead Wastewater Treatment Plant to the Maryland Environmental Service in the amount of $40,754 and no cents. Second. Okay, I got a motion. I got a second. Any discussion? Seeing here none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, you all are two for two. Now let's talk about replacing water, water valve bolts. Johnsville Road Corridor. Okay, we are um, requesting your approval to award a contract 
for the replacement of water valve bolts at 26 locations along the Johnsville Road corridor of the Freedom District Service Area to HTI contractors in the amount of 36,700. I'll get this right. $36,372. Um, this award is through one of our term contractors. Um, the locations were bid collectively in a grouping to generate interest and in competitive pricing. Um, bids were solicited from four contractors and proposals were received from two of those contractors. Um, and as you can see below, uh, the contractors and the uh, bids that came in. And again, this is within the approved budget and we should not need any additional funds. I'm going to turn it back over to Andy. Gentlemen, th this item is similar to previous water valve projects that, that were presented to this board for approval in 2019 and 2020. Water valves installed throughout the county and region during the periods of heavy construction in the 1980s and 90s included unbelievably cast iron bolt connections to water mains. This problem is by no means uh, exclusive to Carroll County. As, we, as my staff has experienced all too often, cast iron water valve bolts rust over time and snap and fail both, both unexpectedly as well as, as well as when the water valve is being turned for, for, for maintenance uh, use or for a system need. These bolt failures are a continuing challenge for us. Lack of confidence in, in the integrity of the cast iron bolts uh, absolutely uh, limits our, our routine maintenance activity. It is estimated that approximately 30% or 1,100 of the 4,300 water valves in the Freedom District were installed with cast iron bolts. This, this project is an ongoing proactive approach to replace the cast iron water valve bolt assemblies with stainless steel bolts. The focus of, of this is the Johnsville Road Corridor in Eldersburg, and it, it does include the replacement of bolts and pavement repair work on a total of 26 water valve assemblies. The average cost per location is $1,400. This has come down from our previous average of approximately $1,800 per location. So we're, we're very happy with, with, with the bid amount by HTI contractors, and it, it, abs it absolutely d d does represent a fair value to both the, con the county and the contractor. Okay. Can we use the uh, cast iron bolt being replaced as uh, paperweights or something like that? Or if you would like some, I'd be more than happy. <laughs> but yeah, they're, uh, yeah, yeah, it's quite the problem that we have. Wow. Any uh, comments on this? I appreciate all the work y'all are doing. I'll move the board of commissioners award contract for the replacement of water valve bolts at 26 locations along the Johnsville Road corridor of the Freedom District Service area. To HTI contractors in the amount of thirty-six thousand three hundred seventy-two dollars. Second. second. I got a motion second. Any discussion on this? Pretty straightforward. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, three three. Let's make it all four. Electrical service extension to Hampstead South Pump Station. Okay. Uh, we're requesting your approval to award a contract for direct electrical service extension for the Hampstead South Pump Station. To BGE in the amount of $62,570. This, again, this um, amount is within the proposed budget and we should not need any additional funds. Gentlemen, this project is an interesting project. Um, the Hampstead South Pump Station is located between the Joseph A. Bank and the BTR or the Black & Decker properties on the west side of Maryland 30 in Hampstead. Joseph A. Bank built the pump station for the county or transferred it to, to the county in, in 2011 to provide wastewater improvements to, to the rum plant. As part of this construction, power to the pump station was provided through the Joseph A. Bank's complex. I don't know the rationale or background behind that, but, but that's how it was set up. The, the, the general concept was, was that this arrangement would be upgraded by the county to a standalone service as the service area to the pump station expanded. Well, the service area to the pump station has expanded and it's time for us to, to, to supply a direct source of power to the pump station rather than, than through the Joseph A. Banks uh, warehouse itself. So the, the, this request is for the BGE cost to, to provide the electrical service to the pump station facility directly from Maryland 30. Um, there will be another project that, that I will be presenting to the board for, for construction improvements to the pump station itself within the next uh, several months. We, I believe that we have to move the, uh, the uh, generator to a, to a, to a new, new location on, on the pump station site itself and also do, do some minor conduit improvements. So the, the, this, the approval for this is strictly for the BGE service improvements from Main Street to the pump station. Did this go out and bid? 
this did not. It, it's it's a it, it, it's it's BGE itself. It's right. a they 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 only do their own work. You know, BG and E usually subcontracts this out. I was wondering. Yeah. That's on them, they, isn't it? They yeah. may sub it out from <coughs> right. their but standpoint, yeah, but, that, but that's we That's on them to do it. Right. That's on them. They're the only yeah. game in town. So. <coughs> so we give them money. They they do whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Any uh, any questions? Any discussion points? Yep. Dick, you want to take this? Up to you. Just how long a site is this? How what distance? If I recall correctly, it's about 800 to 1,000 feet. It's it's if you're in the parking lot area between the two complexes, it's 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 just before the first pond area. Okay. All right. I move the board of commissioners award a contract for direct electrical service extension for the Hampstead South pump station to BG&E in the amount of $62,570 and zero cents. Second. I got a motion second. <clears throat> Any question, discussion? All in favor? Oh, aye. aye. <clears throat> Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Andy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now let's talk about term contract use, pipe video inspection services. Doug? Who's coming up? Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Good. Go for it. So we're here today to seek your concurrence to utilize an existing term contract with Standard Pipe Services LLC to perform uh, inspections of approximately 1,411 linear feet of storm drain piping uh, in the amount of $74,900. Um, this video inspection work is part of our FY22 pavement rehabilitation work where we, where we evaluate the current conditions of our pipes ranging in size from 15 inch to 60 inch to determine the appropriate repair methods before we go in and do the pavement repair methods next year. So we're utilizing a Bureau of Utilities Term contract to perform this work. Uh, Standard Pipe Services LLC has performed this type of work in the City of Westminster before. So do you have any questions? 1400 or 14,000? 14,100. Okay. Don't we have our own video ins pipe video inspection uh, apparatus? I thought we purchased them years ago not for this type of work right they they have a a, a large uh, one in utilities it's basically a force through if you will it's not it's not meant to drive through the pipe and uh, see all the things and provide the detailed data that that these inspections do and they are quite detailed you literally right. can look at these videos and decide what you need to do before you go in and pave the roads they're measuring the, the pipes we also get the the qualified individuals that come with that that are certified to do the inspection yeah. and perform the reports right. um, I just remember yeah. buying some video oh, yeah. yep. inspection stuff and I think utilities sure you utility uses that to locate where a leak is or something okay. like mm -hmm. that yep thought that was a listening I'm just kidding it was a listening device for that too wasn't it <laughs> for, for leaks it's listening they do video? well there are some yes. listening devices yes. for leaks yep yes, yes sir I pay attention sometimes <laughs> Okay. Any other uh, comments, questions? I make a motion the Board of Commissioners approve the Department of Public Works to utilize the term contract with Standard Pipe Services LLC in the amount of $74,900. Second. I got a motion. I got a second. Any discussion on this one? All in favor? Aye. 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 Got it. 5 0. Okay, Thank you. gentlemen, let's talk about approval to use. The current term contract for construction inspection services. Okay, we're back here again to seek your concurrence to continue to use the term contract with Wallace Montgomery for a construction, contractual construction inspector. Uh, on the 3rd of June, we were here before to request the concurrence for about 12 weeks of service uh, because we have a vacancy. After several interviews and several offers, we finally filled the position. However, the new hire cannot start till September 16th. So we need an additional three weeks in the amount of about $6,960 uh, for a total, I guess it would be about 15 weeks of uh, contractual services. Yeah. As you recall, when we were here before, uh, we being short in our construction inspection staff, um, our hand has been forced because we have a federally funded project that 
we are required to keep one inspector fully assigned every day, the entire day, to that project. So said inspector is not allowed to multitask, and until we get a new inspector on board, uh, our workload is just not manageable with the inspectors that we have uh, in order to keep up uh, on the projects because we need to make sure as things go in the ground, they're done correctly because we only get one shot at that. We've got to have eyes on it when it's happening and uh, we need to have enough bodies to put around. So this inspector has worked well and we're just asking your concurrence to continue this until our new inspector's on board, at which time we'll no longer need this contract. Th this inspector is currently inspecting all our public works agreements or developer projects. So that's where they're assigned to make sure that we have somebody for that work. Is this a 1099 work or is it, do you it's know? It's through a term contract. It's through a term contract. Yes, yes. And it's a term contract that we put together. Yes, we yes sir. Oh, do we ever, well, I apologize. Just one more question. Do we ever think through potentially hourly work or uh, by project as opposed to weekly for something like this? We pay by the hour. Right. So if they only work a four hour day for some reason, it rains and all the, con all the contractors go home, we only pay for four hours. But we've we set up a normal eight hour day for them and then we pay by the hour for the eight hour day, but we're assuming a 40 right. hour work week. So this is up to? Up to, yes. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Not to exceed. Yes. But our rain has come usually in the afternoons or evenings, and yeah. most of our contractors no, have you. been moving along, so we're assuming we're going to have a 40-hour work week. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. I move the Board of Commissioners approve the continued use term contract with Wallace Montgomery in the amount of $2,320 per week, not to exceed an additional $6,960. Second. Okay. I got a motion in a couple seconds. Any discussion on this? Here and seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Absolutely. Now let's talk about the purchase of a 333G as in golf compact track loader. Exciting. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, the Office of Procurement in cooperation with the Bureau of Fleet Management requests your approval to purchase one new 33G compact track loader from Jesco Inc. In the amount of $76,638.20. This purchase is being made through a source well contract number 032515 JDC that was competitively bid. This amount is in the adopted FY22 budget and no additional funds will be necessary. Hmm. So, Commissioners, this replaces a uh, current New Holland um, skid steer track loader that we have. Um, the, the particular unit that is in stock right now um, creates a number of challenges for us. One is, is that it will not work with any of the current um, attachments or implements that we have with all of our others because all of our others pieces of apparatus are standard. Uh, this one is not. This will allow us to standardize it. It also allows us to bring in a closed cab piece of equipment, which we've been trying to do because then we can use it in the wintertime, mm -hmm. not just in the summer and on roads projects. Um, we originally, uh, this was before you on the agenda a couple weeks ago, I, I pulled it off. I was not happy with the, uh, with the price that the company was giving us on trade-in, mm -hmm. so we took that out of our agreement and we will be selling this outright at auction where I believe we can get at least twice as much money uh, for this unit and looking at the comparable prices as they were going to give us on trade-in. Hmm. So uh, that, that's the outside of that. I know the Ag Center is looking for one, aren't they? <laughs> Well, <laughs> they, they can bid on it. Give me a call, or they can bid on <laughs> um, it. They, <laughs> they didn't have uni universal hookup. They did not. Uh, we have tried with that, and and we haven't been able to use that. And and it's been it's been a challenge for the team. Uh, this uh, Jim and 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 thanks Jim for coming. Sorry for in. being late. You're never late. Uh, he was. Uh, he we. It's been a challenge for us to keep this there. It has also. As you know, uh, Commissioner Weaver, when you get out and used to working with the equipment, when we don't get this stuff on the road every day, it seems to create more problems for the piece of equipment than, than it's worth. So then every time we did go to use it, we couldn't because there was a problem mechanically of from its setting. And so this is a very useful piece of equipment to us, and we want to get it back out on the road. And we feel this will be the best option. Uh, we. We, as in the team that we currently have in place managing that, we're not responsible for this when it came in. But as we evaluate our processes, trying to save everything and make the best use, we feel this is the best use for this. 
I liked your analogy about the equipment sitting because it's true in humans too. If we're too sedentary, we, we <laughs> lose our edge. Can you get this piece of equipment? Is it on the law? Yes, sir. We oh. do have a, an agreement on board. We have the equipment waiting on us, and if you approve it, uh, they will have it for us. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. And you, but you're right. Those have been challenges, and we have mm -hmm. to try to stay ahead of that game. Okay. I'll make the Board of Commissioners approve the purchase of one uh, 333G compact loader to Jesco in the amount of $76,638.20. Second. Okay, good discussion. Any further discussion, questions? I have Same to ask a question. Business. just have to ask it. How come we bought the piece of equipment that won't work with anything else that we have? I know it's before your time and you buy it, but it just seems... You know, I, do I don't that. know. I mean, obviously, I, I, we could sit here and guess all day, and okay. uh, but but I wouldn't be able to give you a truthful answer. Okay. I can only tell you that when, when I go out with the team and we look at things and I look around, and one of our keys is now that I'm, I'm, I'm filling in for Keith, as you know there, but the good news is we have a new bureau chief coming on board starting the 19th. Thumbs up on that. <laughs> and um, we, we look at all our processes. One of my big things is why is that sitting here? You know, it doesn't right. look like it moves. And then when you start to get the background stories of things, there's a reason. It sits here because it doesn't fit anything. Right. Right. Okay. So, so yes. can I elaborate a little on this? One of the reasons that this has got wheels on it, we go down in yards that are sometimes saturated and this thing gets stuck. And that's why we wanted the track loader because the tracks flow better on mm -hmm. kind of saturated ground. The other thing was this was the third New Holland that we bought over from years before and each one of those have been replaced with John Deere's. The, for the, the equipment is that we bought for them only really fit the John Deere's and that's, and the New Holland's weren't really used for the blacktop part of it. We've gotten more into patchwork over versus yard work and so the milling heads and stuff fit on these John Deere's and that's kind of where we, why we went to, towards that piece of equipment. So the scope of that use has kind of changed a little over the years. Okay. Thanks, Jim. So, thank you. You know, I'm sure the uh, decision to purchase that years ago was the best decision made with the information they had at the time. Exactly. So, <laughs> okay, I think I had a motion and a second. Anything further? The price of these things is going up daily, so. So let's daily buy it now. A lot okay. of steel in them. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, let's move on to the public safety training controls retrofit. And you are going to be joined. Justin. Good morning. Okay. Good morning, Commissioners. Let's go. Good morning. Good morning. The Office of Procurement and Cooperation with the Bureau of Facilities requests your approval to use term contractor Johnson Controls, Inc. to retrofit the Fireman Training Building with Metasys Controls. The cost of $45,265 includes all material, labor, and equipment to complete this project. This contract will be awarded through Howard County Public Schools Competitively Solicited Contract RFP number 005-20-B3 to Johnson Controls, Inc. This cost is within the project budget and no additional funds will be needed. Morning, Commissioners. Morning. We're here today for a decision to award Johnson Controls the contract to remove the existing carrier controls and replace them with Metasys controls. This will include replacing the controls for the hot water system, which includes two circulator pumps, three boilers, and 23 fan powered VAV boxes uh, with zone sensors. <clears throat> the current control system is not connected to our building automation system, which provides staff real time and data and remote access to, to our troubleshooting. The lack of compatibility is causing continual issues in temperature controls and access. Um, we're all obviously making, the, I'm sorry, I got lost here, uh, controls, repeat visits to the site and troubleshooting that currently control system. The new unit units will incorporate into our energy management program for additional cost savings on our energy consumption. This will provide more comfortable working environment for staff, reduce our site visits and troubleshoot and manage remotely on these systems. Um, Johnson Controls normally now they have our contract on 35 buildings, 40 buildings. Uh, what they're going to come do is they're going to come in, take all these old controls out, put their controls in, we can look at them remotely, troubleshoot, temperature controls, all from the shop. 
which is going to save us time, energy, standardize our systems throughout county buildings. Um, what questions may you have on this, this project? Isn't very old, is it? The system? Uh, seven years old, Commissioner. Um, the building was, and when it was put in, it was put in with carrier controls. And currently, when we do have issues and carrier has to come out to troubleshoot or replace something, we're paying charges, we're paying extra costs for them to come out on site when we can do it in-house and also do it with our Johnson Controls current contract that we're paying for quarterly. This all is included for them to come out to uh, reprogram or troubleshoot controls. Just mess with you. Probably um, not a good day to dig public safety. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any comments, questions? Well, this all makes sense, what you're saying. It makes perfect sense. But the other system's only seven years old. I mean, it's just. Yeah, it's. Uh, How long do the systems normally last? Or, or, and I, my guess is they didn't have all the updates that we're looking for for this new system when we bought the, the older one. Yes, Commissioner. Normally, um, you know, here going forward, we're standardizing our control system and our package that we put out the bid for new buildings, so we won't have these issues going down the road. Um, this will be from here on out. Will be a building construction facilities team effort to get what we want in these facilities, so we don't have to come back before you two years later to put in what we want. It will already be done on the front side. With that, I move the Board of Commissioners award these services to Johnson's Control Incorporated to retrofit the Public Safety Training Center with Matassi's controls in the amount of forty-five thousand two hundred sixty-five dollars. Second. Okay, got a motion. I got a second. <clears throat> Any discussion, questions? Seen here, none. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank okay. you. Thank, thank you. you, gentlemen. Signatures for letter of intent and petition requested for Carroll Community College systemic <coughs> renovations grant application. Okay. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Morning. Only one bow tie this morning? <laughs> Only one. Just one today. That makes you special. I tried to get JB <laughs> on board, but he, he wouldn't go for it. <laughs> Uh, as you know, we were before you last week to give you a briefing on additional funding needed for the two systemic renovation projects at Carroll Community College. Um, joining me today uh, is Eric Burdine, Deputy Director of the Department of Public Works, uh, Mr. John Bowers, Bureau Chief, Department of Public Works. And um, for support, we have uh, Justin, McG Justin McGonnell, <clears throat> he was just before you, Facilities Bureau Chief. Just to give a brief recap, the systemic renovations include the removal and replacement of the fire alarm system, replacing the coolant, thus the chillers and the boiler systems. These two systemic renovation projects are funded by a grant from the state at 52% and the county, which is at 48%. The total amount of funds needed to complete these projects is in the amount of 3,251,000. Previously planned funds for FY23 budget includes $1,309,080. The 95% current cost estimates, design, and construction drawings show an additional county contribution needed of $1,677,920. <coughs> the college has drafted a resolution document to the state signed by the college president, Mr. Uh, Dr. Ball. With your approval today, uh, signatures are needed on the state's letter of intent and, peti and petition authorizing local funds in conjunction with submitted state funds being requested. Okay. Um, just to add on to that, um, that those two <coughs> documents, the letter of intent and petition is uh, do into the college as soon as possible. They do have to get that into uh, MHEC, uh, Maryland Higher Education, and DBM by the 20th of this month. So in respect to you all, obviously, um, we would like to get that in as soon as we can, considering that obviously uh, you have MAKO to attend and so forth. So, so a refresher, if you will, again, the 48% responsibility that we have 
and this might be a Ted question, is coming from or is not currently in, etc., etc. Fill in blanks as you see fit. <laughs> well, as we tackle the next budget process, we will have to, to deal with this. Right. So it's not currently in the CIP for this project. Right. Well, there is there is budget for this, but not sufficient budget. Right. right. Okay. I just wanted to bring that up again. So. And um, as you look to approve signing this letter, I just wanted to uh, remind you, asking for this money doesn't guarantee us of anything, but if we don't ask for it in this way, then we are guaranteed of not getting anything. <laughs> right. Well, which is the bottom line here. I mean, you know, if we don't get the 52% from the state, Thanks. we've got to do this anyway. So it's sort of a no-brainer for me, but I just want to be clear that it's not in the budget yet, so we're going to have to come up with that in order to accomplish that, if we indeed are successful at getting the state funding. Yes. Correct. And, I, and I, I would like to add, um, and obviously I'm in no way speaking for the state, but in speaking with MHEC personally, and I know the college has as well, and also with DBM, um, they are well aware of this, these requests coming before them. Um, they're already preliminary on board with it. So um, they've kind of done their legwork on that as well. So again, nothing is set in stone at this time, but they are aware of it. So I, I feel confident that right. um, the state will put forth their portion. Let's hope so. Yes. Okay. All right, I, I'm going to make the motion we sign the uh, letter of intent uh, for this project in the amount of $3.251 million. I'll second that. Okay, I got a motion and I got a second. Anything further in the discussion? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Thanks. Have a good day. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, okay, let's talk about the regional airport. Request approval to submit a grant application. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Doing fine. And how are you? Every day is a good day. <laughs> doing well. Okay. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Eric and I are here this morning to seek your approval to submit the grant application for the acceptance of the airport rescue grant made available to the air for the Carroll County Regional Airport. FAA has noted, not, notified the county that a grant of for 59000 in funding for airport expenses has been made available the air, through the American Rescue Plan Act. The grant money is being provided for operational support to airports during this time of economic disruption. Funding is coming directly from the U.S. General Treasury General Fund and is to be used for airport operational expenses, personnel, cleaning, sanitization, excuse me, janitorial services, and so on. Okay. No salary increases? Uh, that's on the top. No. <laughs> <laughs> Was it was the fee based on the size of the airport? Yes, it was. They okay. took the took a pool of general aviation airports. I think it was a hundred million dollars, and they just divided it. That's what I thought. Equally okay. amongst them all. Makes sense. Okay. okay, I'll move the board of commissioners approve the submittal of the American Rescue Plan Act grant application and approve acceptance of the grant for the Carroll County Regional Airport. Second. I got a motion. Got a second. Good stuff. Any discussion? Here and seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, Thank you, you commissioners. commissioners. Move forward. Thanks. Mr. Thank Myers, you. brush up on your guitar so you can be in that. Uh, You're asking for trouble. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Request to approve resolution number 1109, TEC 2021, budget transfer from the reserve for contingencies to facilities regarding North Carroll High School, or North Carroll High property. Go ahead, Jim. Good morning, Commissioners. On July the 8th, uh, I was in front of you uh, for a budget transfer of $80,000 to cover ongoing expenses, operational expenses for mowing, utilities, uh, and general maintenance for the North Carroll High School building uh, for the months of July and August. Uh, the, um, the date of closing has uh, moved uh, as you, mm -hmm. the board uh, discussed last week to the end of September 
and we are asking for transfer per this resolution of a transfer of forty thousand dollars into the bureau of facilities in order to continue on the maintenance mowing and utility cost uh, payments for the facility has to be done um, i talked <clears throat> to the um, the purchasers tuesday evening they are uh, delayed a little bit due okay. to stormwater management and um, they're pushing as fast as they can their engineering firm to get this in they want to have this by september 30th it's delaying everything they haven't planned for um it's all in the engineering right now uh, so i guess we're delayed until the end of september now you're asking for Eighty thousand and from reserve from contingencies on this, correct? Uh forty thousand at this 000. point. Uh, you've 47. already previously approved eighty thousand for July and August. Okay. Okay. I'll move the board of commissioners approve resolution number uh zero tech twenty two dot zero five, a budget transfer for forty thousand dollars from reserve for contingencies to Department of Public Works. Uh, Bureau of Facilities for Operation and Maintenance Expenses at the former North Carolina High School building for the months of September 2021. Second. I got a motion, I got a second. Any discussion on this? I hope this is the last exactly. transfer. Knock on wood. That's, that's exactly uh, the way I feel about this. Okay. Any, yeah, comments? Seeing, here, none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Stop watering the grass over there. Ain't <laughs> to cut it so <laughs> Knock it off, day. Justin. I'll take any water that hits that land, put it to the farm. <laughs> the farmers need it. Yeah, Run it down the lot or something. There we okay. Go. Um, <laughs> public comment. Do I have any public comment in the room? Okay. Chris, do I have any public comment? Yes, sir. We have two callers on the line. I'm going to unmute them ask them to speak for the three minutes and um, but first identify themselves i'm going to start with caller four okay i'm going to unmute them now caller four you are unmuted you will have three minutes to make your public comment is that me that is you okay i'm simone blancher good morning um i would like to comment on the harrison we share development proposals that you will discuss this afternoon I live on Boltler Road in Mount Airy um, and am a Carroll County resident. Um, without the opportunity to see the proposals as of yet, um, I am in favor of a proposal that is strictly residential. The St. John's proposal is described as a mix of commercial and residential. Residents of Carroll County have been organizing around the development of this property for over a year now, and we were successful in getting the IDA to back out of an annexation deal that would have destined this property to be developed as a 36 building office park. Residents and taxpayers of this publicly owned land do not want to see a business park or commercial center on this property. Furthermore, the property is currently zoned R40,000. Although the RFP encouraged commercial development, according to the Carroll County Department of Planning and Zoning, any rezoning would have to meet Maryland standards for change or mistake or be part of a comprehensive rezoning process for plan implementation. This is not an easy process, especially when the community is in favor of keeping the zoning as is for the county owned property that the county spent $21 million of taxpayer money to purchase when it lost the lawsuit against the previous developer. It seems that Jack Lyburn will be recommending the St. John's proposal, which is described as commercial and residential. One only need to look at Liberty Exchange in neighboring Sykesville to see an example of a St. John's developed 40 acre business park with seven predominantly vacant buildings to see why going with St. John's is not in the best interest of the community or the environment. I would ask that commissioners hold a visioning session with residents about the future of this land where residents can look at proposals and engage in meaningful dialogue with commissioners before making an offer to a developer. Thank you. Thank you so much. And also just put in context this afternoon's open session uh, as shared, Jack Lyburn will be sharing with us uh, the Harrison Leisure property. So, okay. Uh, Chris, any other callers? Yes, we have two more callers. I'm going to unmute caller six. 
Caller 6, if you are unmuted, please make your public comment and identify yourself. Thank you. Caller 6. You've been unmuted. Caller 6. One more try. Caller 6, you have been unmuted. Okay. Going to Caller 7. Caller 7, you've been unmuted. Please make your public comment for three minutes and identify yourself. Is this me? It is you. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Thank you uh, for giving me a few moments to address the commission. My name is Diane Perney, and I live at 4044 Butler Road in Mount Airy. I would like to talk about the Harrison Lyshear property, uh, item 15 on your agenda for today. I would like to say that I've been watching this piece of property for quite a long time. I moved to this location almost 20 years ago, and one of the reasons we moved here was because the land behind my house is zoned residential. I would, gl I would be glad to have neighbors there. I have requested information about the RFP and the process now for over three months, and I feel like there's no transparency here. The county commissioners have responded to my inquiries asking that another department provide me with details on how the RFP process was conducted, the procedures that ensure appropriate transparency, competitiveness, and guidelines. But that request was sent to deaf ears, and I've never received that information. That being said, I would like to state that the property in discussion is currently zoned as R40,000, not zoned for commercial or mixed use, nor does your master plan have a change to that zoning. The company that's being recommended already has over 4.5 million, yes, million square feet of empty commercial buildings, plus over 800,000 square feet currently under development, and finally, 125 acres yet to be developed. Are we really expecting this development to be filled or even priority to fill by St. John property? Cheryl County currently has over 500,000 square feet of empty commercial space with another 300 acres zoned for commercial use but has yet to be bought or developed. Why add another 200 acres? If I were to vote on this issue, I probably would go with for all developers instead of their instead as their proposal is in accordance with the current zoning and what we, the residents nearest the property, expected Let's not be greedy here. I believe that Carroll County needs to become more forward thinking than we are. We're going to into a post pandemic era where businesses have found that they can rely on their employees to work from home and not need a brick and mortar office. In fact, item 16 on your agenda is a request to accept the grant money from the state for Carroll County to use to assist companies in setting up online sales and telework options. So we keep building more commercial buildings when we know that they won't be occupied? Lastly, I'm very worried about the design of the development and our wa water source. The land is on an aquifer that feeds all of our wells. Our wells are very shallow and we don't or haven't had any issues with them. But once you put commercial buildings on that land, what happens when our wells go dry? And while this subject uh, where is the sewage going to go for this commercial building? I would like to see the plans for the development as was requested as part of the RFP. I believe the town of Mount Airy will also be against this plan as they're planning on multiple commercial developments within the town limits, but close enough to this land that it will turn our town into a little Rockville and Route 27 will become Route 355. Please understand that the neighbors are not against development. We are against any commercial development, as this development can take away our right to a quiet and peaceful enjoyment of our property and lower the values of it. I would like for the county to be more transparent and really look at the best options for the homeowners living closest to this property. Thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Chris, any other callers? Caller 8, you've been unmuted. Please identify yourself and begin your public comment. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I can hear you. Thank you. Great. So, thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Trice, and I res uh, reside at 4066 Bolton Road. I've been a resident here for 18 years. 
Uh, I'm, uh, I agree 100% with what Simone and Diane have commented already, especially with regards to the commercial development. Um, Commissioner Boucher has been to my home personally, and so thank you. And uh, he can attest to what I'm about to tell you. <clears throat> we all sit at the bottom of a hill. The hill is the property that's known as Harrison Leisure. We are not in favor of any commercial development on the part of the property that directly abuts the residential homes on Butler Road. Any development on that property will tower over our homes because that property is on a hill. There's no amount of abatement, firms, or otherwise that will shield our homes from the development. We heard it from the town when we fought it. We'll put in berms, we'll put in shielding. All it takes is a, a step into my backyard. You can see that, that that's, it's not possible. <clears throat> so today we have a cornfield. Tomorrow is unknown, we know that. And while we understand the county is under some pressure to develop the land for revenue generation, I ask you, you know, at what cost to the residents you are already elected to serve? Uh, so we would be in favor of sensible residential development there. Uh, this is what we were expecting 20 years ago when the first development plans fell apart due to county overreach, and that is what we could live with today. Any commercial, uh, any commercial development on that property that abuts our homes will be met with fierce opposition, I assure you. So, you know, Mount Airy has been hosting tours of its vacant commercial properties for some time now. They posted on Facebook, they posted probably in the Messenger or wherever. If there was great interest in bringing business to Mount Airy or, 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 or people that are dying to have businesses here, why do we have so much vacant property here already to begin with? So please consider that when deciding that you want to bring more commercial property to Mount Airy. I think the county made a great decision when it decided to apportion part of that property for parkland, and I would ask that you continue in the right direction and don't impose commercial development, however beautiful the developer says it may be, on the homes and residents that have been here since the 50s. So uh, that's all I have to say, and thank you for the time. Thank you, sir. Chris, any other callers? Commissioner, I wouldn't mind uh, unmuting caller six to see if they're uh, ready to speak yet. Okay, please do. Caller six, you've been unmuted. You have three minutes. Please identify yourself. Caller six. Still asleep. That's <laughs> it, Commissioner. That's all we have. Okay. <laughs> I appreciated uh, no more public comment uh, to be had. Um, do we have anything for open admin right now? We will be going to open session at 1 p.m. Anything want to be shared, said? Okay. Ladies, why don't you come on up and we'll uh, go through the agendas. Let's see. Agendas. Okay, on Monday, August 16th, we have nothing. Tuesday, the 17th, Commissioner Wance will be attend. Will you be attending that uh, planning commission on Tuesday? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, and then 2 p.m. on Tuesday, I will not be attending, Commissioner. I have Weaver. a 1.30 just popped up here in the last couple of days. I will not be attending. I will do my best. I believe they're doing it in person and virtual still. Okay. If I can get the virtual, yeah. If I but if I can get the virtual information, I'll get I'll, the yeah. I'll try. I'll try and make that. If you guys can, I'll. Yeah. I'll fill in for you. Yeah, if you'd like to go over okay. to VFW. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I I still may just just let me know. Yeah. V, if, okay. Yeah. That that's great. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Wednesday, August eighteenth, Maryland Association County Summer Conference. Uh, officially begins, and Commissioner Wance, Rothstein, Weaver, and Frazier will be in person Thursday, August 19th. Uh, again, it is part of the uh, conference, and finishing up on the 19th on Saturday. Um, I will not be there Saturday, or I know you will be Saturday. Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, our own Ted Zaleski uh, is part of the panel discussion at 9 a.m., on the uh, relief funding 
On Saturday. On Saturday morning, yeah. And I, right. I don't know that we've heard from the governor yet on his plans. I know he's going to be down he, there. He, he just, I apologize, he, he just came out with a statement regarding the transportation infrastructure. I know that. Yeah, so, so. he usually gives some sort of a send-off right. message to everybody. Right. So I haven't heard um, <clears throat> yet what that okay. is, but I know at 9 a.m., Carroll County will be front and center. Yep. And I will not, I'll know if, uh, will you be there on Saturday still? Yes, if I'm doing And will Saturday. you be there, Commissioner Weaver, on Saturday? Uh, Burl, yeah. Okay, okay. That's good. Cheering section's good in the, in the audience. And I'm really looking <laughs> forward to uh, Commissioner Frazier's podcast on Sunday, August 22nd. And Commissioner Boucher has an Eagle Scout ceremony down Woodbine at 1 p.m. I have a comment. When you list all the commissioners' names, shouldn't they be alphabetical order? Just kidding. But <laughs> <laughs> we can make that happen. <laughs> yes, Commissioner Zalitsky. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, until rudely interrupted, I will continue on Monday, August 23rd. We have nothing. 24th, still noise on the right. On Tuesday, 24th, there's a chamber business breakfast down in Eldersburg. Commissioner Wance and Rothstein, are you giving this or me? It's yours. Oh. I, 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 think I, I think I put Wance yeah. instead of Weaver. That's my, yeah. my mistake. Are okay. You know? Yeah, I, I wasn't planning on driving to Eldersburg. That's hurtful. Can well, you add my name something to that about list? A rash. You want me to as rash? long as it's alphabetical okay yes. let's just make sure we give them a green card to get down there <laughs> you get it approved <laughs> okay on wednesday nothing on thursday we have we don't have any agenda items closed yet. admin we do have open session schedule for 9 a.m and we'll leave it at that and fill in the blanks as we move forward uh, we do have closed for land acquisition that day on Thursday, the 26th. Nothing scheduled for 27th, 28th, and Commissioner Boucher has the podcast on the 29th. And mm -hmm. if I may, sir, any directors out there have anything for public uh, dispensing they want me to include in that podcast, please contact me, send me the information. I'll be more than happy to announce it, especially if summer coming to an end and school starting and uh, fall will be here before you know it and the weather will feel much more pleasant okay at this can we debate that <laughs> <laughs> at this time uh, we are going to stay in place but i need a motion to recess and reconvene at 1 p.m so moved second i got a motion got a second all in favor aye aye, aye. okay we are recessed at this time mm -hmm.